So, um, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So, we're actually going to be looking at the communication skills for health and social care unit uh, today. So, we'll be doing this over the next four days. There are three learning outcomes on, on day four, lesson four. We'll just go over the assignment brief. Now, the aim of this unit is to actually develop our knowledge and understanding of the communication that happens in health and social care uh, sectors. So we'll be looking at that and we'll be looking at some uh, different communication methods. And we'll also be looking at how to develop our own personal communication skills. So it's very uh, heavily based on uh, how we communicate with others, what sort of theories are used and what sort of processes we can actually use. So like I said, it's uh, three learning outcomes. So the first learning outcome is know how health and social care organizations communicate. The second learning outcome is be able to interact orally with individuals in a health and social care setting. Then the last learning outcome will be be able to communicate information in writing. Now, the communication unit is um, the communication unit is actually one of my favorite ones to do. It's a nice, simple unit is not as heavily word based as some of the previous units that you'll be doing you've done or the ones that you'll be doing in the future it's nice and it's uh, clearly set out and you'll you'll see when you're doing the assignment that it's a little bit um better based to get through so we're going to look at know how help and social care organizations communicate for learning outcome one this has got four past criteria, one merit and one distinction. So 1.1 is outline the principles of effective communication. 1.2 is describe communication models, methods and systems used in health and social care organizations. 1.3 is explain the benefits of both informal and formal communication systems. And then 1.4 explain how technology is used for different types of communication. And then we're going to look at uh, proposed solutions to the barriers to effective communication in health and social care. And then for the, the distinction is evaluate how different uses of technology can enhance or detract from good communication in health and social care organizations. So I'll make my way onto the PowerPoint. Actually, before I do that, I just want to point this out. And I know that I do this for almost every single one of my lessons. But um, it's always a good thing to do. We have indicative content at the bottom. This just tells you exactly what you need to include when you're writing your assignments. So if you get stuck, if you're not sure exactly what you're meant to be doing, or if you just need a bit of, uh, you know, something to check against, always look at this little section here on our indicative content, because it really does guide you in the right way of how um, we want your responses to come back. So now we'll make a start. So learning outcome one, know how help and social care organizations communicate. So we're actually going to look at how to develop our knowledge and understanding of communication in the health and social care sector. So within the different organizations that you have within their different practices, care homes, GPs, hospitals, wherever you are, regardless of wherever you are. And we're going to look at how this will actually help you to develop your own personal communication skills. So uh, what do you do to communicate with your colleagues? What do you do to communicate with your patients or people that are in your care? So we'll be looking at all of that today. So we've got the principles of effective communication here. So the topic is actually going to introduce you to the different forms of communication that are used by healthcare workers, by social care workers, and also the different environments in which they're actually used. So we're going to be looking at the communication that is used to make contact with others and how it can be understood, what communication actually involves, you know, how people actually send messages, how people receive them, how they actually uh, decipher them as well. So what sort of language you need to be using for your audience. And, you know, as humans, we all communicate or send messages continuously. So we either do verbal 
you know, messages, we're talking, we're texting, we're calling, we're email. So communication is actually quite a large part of our lives. So this is something that uh, we're doing unconsciously all the time, but sometimes you don't really think about the different methods that we use. So we'll be going through these here. So we're going to look at a number of communication models to follow. So these are going to have um, th a number of theorists. So we're going to have Aristotle, Scram, Laswell, Warren Weaver. So these are just some people that have uh, done a lot of studies in their days. And they've come up with little theories saying that this is how we communicate. This is how people understand. So we're going to have a look at that. So this is the first communication model that we've got here. So we've got at the beginning is the sender. So that's you, you're sending the message. Then you're composing a message, you're writing it, you're talking, you're texting it, you've composed your message here. The receiver will be the person that you sent your message or email or you're actually talking to. So you've, that this is you, you're the sender, you've composed your message and then you've sent it on. So the receiver will actually receive it and then they're going to look at it, they're going to decipher it. Going, the feedback actually means is how they actually um, understand what is going on, what the actual message is. Do they understand the concept of it? So the receiver puts their feedback together, so they'll compose a message or they'll give you an answer verbally, and then they'll become the sender. And it just goes in like a flow, in like a constant flow circle. So you, first you'll be the sender, then the other person that's receiving it will be the sender. So you just have, it's like a conversation that's going backwards and forwards between yourselves. Sorry, excuse me, I think I'm, yeah. So we're just going to look at what the models of communication actually are. So we've got a definition of what the communication models are. So it's just a way of presenting your um, your messages within a visual method or a verbal method or a text message. So you're just showing, just got some definitions over here, what the nature is, so it's practical or it's visual in nature, what sort of media you're using, are you using pictures, are you using text messages, are you verbally talking? Is the message understandable? So you're speaking to someone, do they, you're speaking to somebody who is, for example, a patient, and they may not necessarily know all the medical jargon that you know, they might not know certain terminologies. So if you're speaking to them the way you would speak to a colleague, then are they actually going to understand what you've said to them? Do you need to, you know, make it simpler? Do you need to simplify your conversation for them? So you need to understand who you're speaking to and how you actually should communicate with that person according to their capabilities. So do you need to explain things a little bit more? Do you need to add images in it? Do you need like picture information cards, like the um, uh, PIC system that you can use in schools for uh, learners who are from a, have a different language? How long will it actually take you to communicate? Is it effective? So these are the things you actually need to be looking at. Like I said earlier, we're going to look at Aristotle, Laswell, Warren Weaver, Scram, Riley, Berlow, and the contemporary model. So we'll go into detail with these now. So Aristotle's model, it actually focuses on, uh, I think Addy is having some issues with her connection. Sorry guys, I'll, there you go. So Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's model actually just focuses on a few elements. So the speaker, the speech, the occasion, the audience, and the effect. Now what Aristotle thinks, now he was in the olden days where the Greek philosophers, um, so he's quite an old Greek philosopher. I've forgotten what year this was made. So what he actually thinks is that the speaker, the person that is speaking, is the only one that actually uh, will actually be influencing the whole of the audience. So the audience is passive and whatever the speaker says, that is actually going to be, that's what's going to go, that is done. So he thinks that 
speaker, for example, is somebody like can be a politician, a trainer, in these type of examples now for where we are now. So when, for example, we've got new Apple products coming out and the owner of the company, he'll come up and he'll do keynote messages or they'll do conferences and he'll be speaking and selling his his items, he'll be selling his Apple phones. So he is a speaker at that time. The speech is what he's trying to sell us. We are the audience. We're just actually listening. We're saying, oh, this is a great product. We should buy this. So the effect of him telling us exactly what he's selling or, you know, because we're influ we're passive, we're influenced by what he's doing, we will run out and we'll go and get the product that he's talking about. Or we'll actually go and do the exact same thing. If it's a politician saying, vote for me, we'll actually run out and we'll go and vote for them. Adi, do you have good connection now? Yeah, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. You've not... You've not missed too much. I could see you popping in and now I had a feeling your connection was bad. Yes, thank you. No, that's good. So, uh, fantastic. We're just actually um, talking about a couple of models and things, so you've not really missed too much. So we're okay. just talking about communication in general. So we look okay. at Aristotle's model. This is where he just thinks that um, the person speaking is influencing his audience. So he says, go out and buy a new phone you will run out and go and buy it. If he's a politician, he, that person will say, uh, vote for me. And then because the audience is passive, they're saying, oh, yes, we're going to go and vote for him. Oops. Then we've got last world model. Now, this model is, is just about the process of communication and its function that actually happens within society. Now, this model also has uh, five components in it. So you've got the first section where you've got a control, a control analysis, where it says that the sender has all the power. Then you've got the content analysis, and this is um, like things to do with uh, stereotyping, what the representation of different groups are, what the actual content actually is going to be of this communication. You've got media analysis, so how is this actually um, getting portrayed? Is it being done over the TV? Is it being done in, um, over the internet? YouTube, is it actually being done face-to-face -face, or are you doing it over the phone? So what sort of media are you using? Then you've got your audience analysis. So you target your particular population, you know, target your um, basis of which audience are you trying to actually manipulate? Which one are you trying to brainwash? The best example I can think is if you're ever watching children's TV around Christmas time. Within those uh, particular programs like on Nickelodeon or um, CBeebies or anything, you'll constantly be getting lots of little adverts popping up. So for Lely Kelly shoes or a particular brand of toy and things or slime, what they're doing is they're targeting their audience, which are the children, and then those children are actually going on and... Uh, saying to the parents, this is what I want for Christmas or this is what I want for my birthday. So you choose your target population. Now, if they were doing those adverts on, uh, say, on BBC One or on Sky One, it wouldn't be as effective because the parents probably wouldn't pay as much attention. You probably end up skimming through or forwarding uh, through those adverts. But with the children, they're going to sit there, they're going to be riveted. So that's what we mean when we say your target population, the one that you want to manipulate. And then the effect of this is, um, are they actually going out and buying the things? Have you exploited this target? Have you been able to get them to run out and buy your product or do what you say? So you start off with the communicator. So that's the person who's speaking. Then it's the message and what they're saying. Medium is what channel they've chosen. Are they sending you a fax, an email? Have they... Um, have they uh, made a done a conference? To whom? That's the receiver. The receiver is the audience. And then you see what's the effect. So within the health and social care setting, the communicator could be the doctor. They've told the patient that this is what needs to happen. They've verbally spoken to them. The patient has actually listened to what's happening and are they actually agreeing with the synopsis? Are they saying, are they agreeing with the diagnosis? So. Um, this is how we can 
put it into a health and social care effect. So we looked at Aristotle and we've looked at um, Laswell. Now we're going to look at the Warren Weaver model, or in some terms, people can call it the linear model of communication also. Now this actually has some key features in it. So it shows that it's the channel, so how is the message being received? So it's a one-way communication. Oh, this should be on here, but that's fine. It's just been um, come over. So what happens in this is that you've got a little extra piece in here, which you can't see at the moment because um, we've got this covering it. So you've got the sender, they're sending the message. But then you might have something called noise in the middle of this. So what will happen with that noise is, for example, if you want to get in touch with me, you might phone the office and you might say, right, uh, you might have one of the uh, admin staff pick up. And they might say, oh, okay, we'll pass the message on to Afsha. So that noise, what I mean is that person that's speaking to you in the middle, that interruption that's in the middle from you getting from A to B. You want to speak to me, but you've had to go through somebody else. That's the particular noise in the middle. So we're not talking about physical noise, we're talking about the interruption that you'll have. So, for example, it'll be uh, you're sending a message to me via fax. The noise is the fax machine. So that's the interruption that you're having in the middle. So when somebody's going to pick that message up, it might not come straight to me. It might come to another member of staff, and then they're walking it over and giving me the message. Then we've got a buzz model, and we can just say SMRC, SMCR for this. So what happens on this is we've just got four main sources on here. So S is for source. So this might be the one person that's doing the message. It might be a company. It might be a group of people. The message is the information that um, needs to be sent. The channel is how it's being sent. So is it text? Is it radio? Is it a letter? Is it an email? And the receiver is the final section in the communication process. And they're the ones that are actually receiving the message. So when the receiver actually receives the message, they'll uh, decipher it. They will actually become the source again. So it goes full circle again. So it gets flipped over. So the receiver becomes the source. They're sending a message through whatever media they choose and then it just goes around and round. So it's like a communication constantly speaking to each other. Then we've got Scram's model. Now Scram says that this information is completely useless unless it's conveyed to others in a certain way. So if you have not given your message in a certain way that the other people can actually understand, what you say is particularly useless. Now, this comes into effect when I was talking about, say, if uh, you're speaking to a patient who doesn't understand certain terms. You've spoken to them, you've given them a lot of information, but at the end of it, it's just wasted breath because you've said what you want to say, but has the other person actually understand, understood what was going on? Have they understood exactly what's happening? They won't have, so that becomes is completely useless in that point. So unless you put it into the way that the person can actually understand according to their own ability, then what you're saying has no effect whatsoever. So we've got something called uh, encoding on here. So encoding is quite important because you're actually um, putting together a message according to your audience, according to the people you're talking to. So you're thinking about the person, you know, do they understand? Is this a colleague? Is this a patient? Is this a friend? How should I speak to them? If it's a colleague, use your terms. If it's a patient, be formal, but let them know in simple terms. If it's a friend you're communicating with, you're not going to be bothered about saying, hello, sir, how are you? You're just going to speak very informally with each other. So you're encoding your message according to who you're going to speak to. 
And when this information actually receipt goes to the person that you're speaking to, so the intended person, so your patient or your friend or your colleague, they're the actual recipient. They're going to be able to understand exactly what you're saying. So in total, this model, Scrum's model, actually just says that encoding and decoding are the most important parts of communication process. So you'll have a, a you, for example, Yulia will encode a message. She'll put down, she'll think, right, this is what I need to say. She'll send the message. And then Addy might receive it. She'll interpret it. She'll put down a message of her own. Then she'll send that message. And then Yulia will receive it and she'll decode it. She'll think, oh, okay, this is what she meant. This is how we're going to talk. This is what's meant to go on. She'll interpret that and then she'll put her own message together again. So this one, in actual fact, like all the others, you're just going in a full circle again. You're having a conversation. You're coding and decoding in uh, accordance with each other. And then we've got the contemporary model. Like I said, there are a lot of models in here. So if there is something that I'm going through too fast or um, if there's something you want to clarify, please feel free to uh, join in. So the contemporary model is actually the most um, modern model of the day now. Scroll down a bit. So this one goes where you're, you've got your communicator. So it's pretty similar to the previous one, to be honest. You've got your communicator, which is the person uh, sending the message. You're putting a message together. You send it. How do you send it? So text, letter, email, um, over video. The receiver receives it. They look at the message. They read it. They understand it. Then they send you their feedback. And then it goes back, backwards and forwards again. So that was the communication models. Um, how are we on that so far? Is there anything you want me to go through over again? I'm going to take this as good silence that we're understanding. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to, if everyone's okay, we'll go on to 1.2. On here, we're just going to look at the describing communication models and systems used in health and social care organizations. So to get a healthy and effective communication system, it's actually a two-way process. But this is where the person who listens tries to understand the other person's point of view. And this will actually help to create a good communication and this involves a process of active listening and checking the understanding. So in regard to health and social care, good communication is really required between the customer. So the customer will be your patient or any person that you're coming in contact with. And also the, the staff, so the clinicians, the um, nurses, the doctors, the care workers, the social workers, anybody that is there, any member of staff. So staff members, they need to have a really good communication. And I believe that in healthcare, this is especially important. You're coming into contact with a million different walks of life. You're seeing different cultures and identities. You're having lots of different people of different age groups coming to you. So it's, you know, it's important that you have communication. They're, there. they're probably there because they're hurt or they're upset or they're not feeling too great or they just need a little bit of extra assistance. So it's very important that your communication methods reflect what they need. Hi, Ganya, how are you? Um, I can see you, but I can't um, hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I, oh. I can. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'm you so missed... sorry that I... Yeah, oh, no. I'm so it's sorry. No um, You've missed uh, 1.1, I... 1. 1, but we're just starting 1.2 now, so uh, oh. uh, it shouldn't be too bad. Okay. Too much. okay, I had my vaccine day before yesterday. Oh, and yes. I'm not feeling too Probably fine. very slow. Hmm. Yeah. 
So I'm sorry. Oh, no, I don't need to apologise, Gandhi. I'm just glad you're here. That's fine. So, um, like I was saying, we've got... The communication is extremely important. So there are a number of theories of communication which we've actually looked at. So there's a lot of them that we've done. We're going to be looking at Abraham Maslow's theories and how they're actually uh, uh, applied in health and social care sector. You might have actually seen Maslow's uh, theories in previous studies as well or in anything future. Maslow is very big within a lot of uh, different courses, so even within education as well. So schools, everything, they focus on Maslow a lot. So we've got things like humanistic theory on here. So this will explain what individuals need and what they need is a caring, loving, you know, members, they need people to look after them. They need someone there that will actually care about them and show love towards them. It gives them self-esteem, dignity, they get honour and they feel that they're actually involved. So within health and social care, staff members are actually given training um, you, you know, treat individuals in a humanistic way so that you're actually looking after their needs. You've got the cognitive theory. So this theory is implemented um, quite suddenly. It's not something that have, used to happen before. So this is related to the brain and the intelligence of the individual. So it leads to how they code information, how they encode it, so how are they processing what you're speaking to? Are they able to speak to you within a certain ability? So how they actually store that information. Then we've got the social theory. So it's a study of social facts. Where have I gone? There you go. So it just deals with sort of any discussions and any uh, methods that you might have, anything just within... Do you want to see just how they socially uh, can interact, how they socially behave? Then we've got behavioural theory, and this is how a, an individual can actually deal with certain things, what their mental status is, um, how they can actually, um, you know, cope with certain information. Is it good for you to pass information on to them, or do you need to give it to somebody that might be caring for them? Then you've got the psychoanalytical theory. And this actually deals with the stress, emotion, and what sort of behaviours a person has. Because obviously, within your industry, when you're working, you know that not everybody is the same. There's going to be different people that can... Probably some people will get extremely stressed. Some will be emotional. Some might be aggressive. So you've got to see what type of person. I think you can be quite judges of um, a person when you're actually within a certain environment, especially if you're dealing with different people day to day. You get to understand what type of people you're in front of. So within health and social care, it's, it is actually a duty that you are trained for all of these things so that you've got the right source of communication to your customers, so you've got the right techniques and the knowledge and the skills that, you know, will actually help you in your day-to-day -day working. So these are very important so that you know that this is how we're meant to deal with a particular person. It keeps you out of hot water. It'll help you within your daily work. So when we've got that, I want to speak about the Maslow's uh, theory as well. I'll just get, go on to that in one moment. So Maslow, as we mentioned before, is just is just a theorist and he actually created something called the hierarchy of needs. So this is Abraham Maslow, and this happened in 1943, actually. And according to him, humans all have basic needs. Now, they're actually within... Uh, excuse me, they're actually within three little sections. So you've got a section for basic needs, you've got a section for psychological needs and then you've got a section for self-fulfillment needs now within the basic needs now this is everybody for basically for every human so whether you're a child in a school setting or if you're working it's your patients this actually will will be applicable to everybody so basic needs 
is showing that they need their site physiological needs. So that's things like food, water, warmth and rest. So within your cells, uh, have you got access to a staff room? Are you able to go and sit down uh, on a comfy chair? Is it warm where you're working? Then you've got your safety needs. So have you got your security and your safety? So this will apply to all of you within as workers or even your patients. Do you feel safe where you are? Have you got, are you secure in where you are? Do you feel comfortable where you are? Then you've got your psychological needs. So this is things like your belongingness and your love needs. So where you've got your relationships and you've got your friends, is this will actually help you to develop your self-esteem and your self-worth. And then you go on to your esteem needs. So you've got your prestige. Are you feeling accomplished? When you're working, if you've done something good, are you getting recognised for that? Are you actually being told, well done, you did a fantastic job? Or are you um, sitting there and are you actually listening carefully and quietly to the, your patient? Are you actually giving them the time of day for them to explain a particular thing? They might have something on their mind. They might just want to talk to you for a good 10 minutes. But are you paying attention to them? So that will, if you are, it'll help to develop their self-esteem and the feeling of accomplishment. And then right at the top of this, so it's like a pyramid. So right at the top is you've got self-fulfillment needs. This is where you're gaining self-actualization, where you're actually achieving your own potential. So you're, you know, probably being creative, you're being happy. So what you're doing right now with this course, you're actually working towards your self-actualization. So you know, each and every one of you, what your aim is, where you want to go. And while you're doing studies or you're doing something for yourself, you're actually working towards that goal and it's going to help you feel like you're achieving your potential, which is fantastic. So this it can be applied to uh, patients, workers, people in, in general life, to be honest. So that was 1.2. We're going to go into 1.3. Does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah. Probably go on. No, thank you. Okay, brilliant. Let's go on then. So 1.3, explain the benefits of both informal and formal communication systems. So as care workers, so you actually use different forms of communication during your working day or working night, depending on what shift you're on. So these can include verbal communication skills, talking, listening, Non-verbal communication skills like a touch, you know, you might want to touch your shoulder and comfort someone or eye contact or your facial expressions and um, just gest gestures like thumbs up or shrugging. So those are non-verbal communication. So care workers actually need to use both of these forms of communication when they're giving or receiving information about any type of care that has been provided. It just shows that you're paying attention. So somebody might be speaking to you and you might, instead of saying, okay, yes, yes, okay, yes, yes, you might just want to nod or you might want to um, give a small gesture, have eye contact so that that person that you're speaking to understands that you're listening. Being a care worker or somebody that actually works in health and social care setting is a very difficult job because you're not only looking after your patients, but you're actually looking after their families as well. So you're providing emotional support to a lot of individuals, to their families. You're carrying out assessments of individual needs. So it's a very full-on job. So when you're doing it, little things unconsciously, it can be difficult to be focused on something all the time. But when you're doing unconscious, non-verbal communication, which we all we do, we shrug or we nod or we cross our arms, it, it's important that you're able to uh, communicate with them. So in other words, care workers need to be able to multitask. They need to communicate, they need to carry out assessment, they need to provide emotional and physical support. So it is, it is a lot of work that you're having to do and a lot of tasks that you're having to do probably within a few seconds of time, to be honest. Over the next few slides, we're actually going to be looking at different types of communication methods. So formal, informal, and we'll look at what sort of types that you can use to assist within your own communication needs. So you've got verbal communication. So it's when you're speaking to each other. 
so you can respond to questions. You're finding out about any individual problems or individual needs. You're contributing to any meetings that you're in. You might need to break bad news from time to time. So um, it's how you do that. You're going to be support, uh, providing support to your patients and also to family members. And then you're probably going to have to deal with complaints and problems or right now with the, how COVID is going on, if you're in a ward, people are allowed to leave their area. So you're probably uh, doing a lot of waitressing for them as well, running around getting cups of coffee or something to eat or, you know, warming something up for them. So it's a lot of things that you're having to do. So the communication cycle that we're going to look at, it shows that effective communication is a two-way process. Now, not a lot of people think about this. When you think about communication, you think, oh, speaking, talking, that is communication. But that's only 50% of it. 50% is speaking, is you talking to somebody. But 50% is also listening. Listening is a lot harder than speaking. So what I find sometimes I'll talk, I won't pause enough, and then I'll carry on talking again. And then I'll see that somebody else is trying to interject, they're trying to say something, and I'm having to stop what I'm saying. So sometimes you just need to uh, be, pause, listen to what's going on, and just be patient. Listening is extremely hard, but it is 50% of uh, what you need to be doing. When you're listening, it's easy for you to actually understand what's going on, what the other person is actually trying to convey to you as well. Nonverbal communication, like I just uh, said before, is crossing your arms if you're feeling upset or uh, emotional or defensive. It's when you're, you know, you might, somebody might be telling you something and they're getting upset. You might just want to pat their shoulder or just put an arm around them, depending on how comfortable you are and how well you know that person. So it's your body language and how you're using your body language. So your body language is actually helping you to send messages. So if you're standing there with your arms crossed over your chest and you're probably showing them, I don't care or I'm angry. But if you've got an open body language where your arms are hanging down and you're relaxed, you're pay you know, you've got eye contact with the other person, you, you feel that yeah, that, that this person that is actually listening to me, they're actually paying attention to me. So it it will help in that way. So I, for one, when it comes to eye contact, I'm not the greatest person for eye contact. I don't uh, like to, uh, I feel like I'm staring someone down if I'm looking in their eyes too much. So I'm constantly flitting up and down, up and down. And normally I look away. So that's an area that I particularly need to work on. So as a person, I think that there's areas that you actually will be aware of where you can work on and how you can do it. So nonverbal communication is constantly you're constantly doing something just when you're at work or when you're um around the house if you've got other families members with you just pay attention to when they're talking how their body is are they crossing their arms are they relaxed are they loose have they got their legs crossed over uh, each over the knee just focus on and then you'll actually notice that non-verbal communication is constantly happening So we've got a little form, like a little chart here that just goes over what type of forms of non-verbal communication we have. So your facial expression. So it's where you're smiling or you're frowning, touching or contacting, you're holding someone's hand or you're just putting your hand on their shoulder, gestures or thumbs up. So you're showing you're agreeing with them or you're happy or you're being angry and you're shaking your fist and you're like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't agree with anything you're saying. Your proximity, so how close are you to that person? Are you too close where they feel like you're being a little bit aggressive? Or are you just close enough where they feel that they're re it's reassuring and that they can accept? So you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. You don't want to make the person feel like you're towering over them and being aggressive with them. But you just want to feel you know, have a nice medium, which it can be difficult to guess sometimes, but guessing on other people's body language, you can decipher if it's too close or not, and how comfortable you are, to be honest. 
So as it is, when you're with your family members, you are somebody you trust or a really good friend or someone you love, you probably need a lot less space between yourselves because you know that you have a trusting and a loving relationship. But when it's somebody that you might have met for the first time or in a patient um, clinician type of situation, you don't want to be going so close up to them that your shoulders are touching or anything. So maintain a distance. Which, to be honest, is not a problem these days because we're having to maintain our two metres space anyway, so that cuts that out. Then you've got eye contact. So do you have, like, short, broken eye contact? Are you nervous? Are you shy? Are you got mistrust? Like I said, that um, when I do eye contact, I'm, I'm really bad at eye contact. I look up and then I look down and I'm probably looking everywhere else. It's just something that I've always been like that. It doesn't mean that I'm not paying attention, just that I don't like staring into someone's eyes. So you can either have it in that way or do you have long, unbroken eye contact? So this might show interest, it might show attraction, but it also might show hostility. So you've got to really understand what you're comfortable with and, and go with that. And we've got signs and symbols and objects of reference. Now, in my earlier days, when I used to teach uh, primary school, I used to have a lot of children who were coming from uh, different countries and uh, so on, and a lot of them were Punjabi or Urdu-speaking children, which is the language I can also speak. So I was okay to communicate with them in that way, but when you're trying to teach uh, English or you're trying to make them accessible to schoolwork, you can't be sitting there constantly speaking uh, their home language. So what we used to do was use something called a picture exchange system. Now on this, it was just a number of, uh, it was a small flashcards with like a picture of a toilet or a picture of uh, some lunch, you know, a picture of saying that next lesson is science. And you'd sort of use that card and you'd say the science lesson is next or do you need to go to the toilet? So you could use that to communicate. So this is the same type of communication that you've probably got within um, your, uh, within your healthcare setting. So it's a signs and symbols. So you might have something like, regardless of whether you're, what language you speak, if you see a red circle with a red line through it, you know that that's no entry. If you see a, a, a picture of a cigarette uh, with a, a red circle and a line through it, you know that means no smoking. So you don't really actually need to understand or be able to read English to understand particular signs and symbols. So they're always really good to be able to help communicate, especially if uh, you've uh, not got an interpreter with you at that time. So we can also think that objects of reference, like things like toys, clothes, jewelry, everyday objects that have special meaning for someone. So if you're trying to, uh, you know, strike up a conversation with someone who might be shy or someone who really doesn't want to speak to you, you could say, oh, that's a beautiful ring you're wearing. And, you know, maybe they'll turn around and start telling you about it. It helps them get more comfortable with speaking to you when you're not going in and starting off with business. A little bit of small talk always helps. So when you have a child come in, if they've got a toy or a blanket, it might, rather than say you need to take that off them, it might be that that's their safety blanket, that's their comfort, that's something that they feel is... Uh, you know, that they're really attached to. Sometimes it's easier for them to just have that there. We also have techno technological aids. So things like communicators, hearing aids, video phones, text messages. Your phone is a fantastic technological aid at the moment. You can type messages on it, show pictures, show videos. So a lot of people, there was a time when there were a lot of uh, disabled people uh, People with physical uh, abilities that were impaired that were using a lot of different types of technology where they were using uh, like a uh, a communicator or hearing aids. But now everybody has got some type of technology, mobile phones, they're emailing, they're using websites like Facebook, Twitter. So these type of things have actually come a long way in it, promoting other users as well mm. that they can actually interact and they can actually be involved in a way that they might not have been a good 10 15 years ago then we've got human aids like interpreters translators uh, somebody who does a uh, british sign language or makaton which it can be in different countries 
Then we've got alternative uh, forms of communication. So people who might not be able to communicate in the normal conventional ways. So they might uh, have uh, to say if they're visually impaired, they're having to touch and they're reading Braille. So we've got uh, fantastic uh, things that I've seen recently is Braille typewriters where young children are actually getting taught how to do this from a very early age. So this is where there's like little raised dots um, in case I'm pretty sure you're all aware of that. And then so that's for visual and for hearing impairments, you've got your obviously your sign language or uh, I can never say this properly, dactylography, where they're actually uh, touching your fingers um, if they're not able to uh, see as well. So um, they can actually feel how you're communicating. And then the last slide for this section is just you've got all of these like I was talking about earlier, your stop signs, your uh, hand over here, stop, keep out, danger, you know, chemicals. So you can recognize at least a, a number of these, no smoking, no entry. So these are easy to understand, even if you don't have your English language skills. So we're going to go on to explain how technology is used in different types of communication. So all this assessment criteria is based on how uh, technology is used for communication. We're going to look at the different uh, technological aids. Uh, so things like um, electronic communicators, hearing aids, video phones, and how these actually aids are designed to help disabled people who might have difficulty sending or receiving messages. So things like assistive devices like iPads, laptops, these can actually be used uh, for voice communication for mute persons. So as we know that many uh, non-disabled people will actually go through these as well. So let's go and make a start on that. So within this, so we talked about different technological aids just previously about how we can actually use them. But now we're actually going to look at barriers to uh, um, communication just to see what sort of barriers there can be. So this assessment criteria, when you go to answering it, it's all going to be about what different barriers there are. So over on this little diagram here, it actually shows us the different types of barriers that can happen when you're communicating. So you've got jargon, which I mentioned earlier, so uh, particular terms and slang and acronyms, different terminologies that you might use within the workplace. If you come up to me, I'm your patient, you start telling me all these heavy words, these big uh, information loaded things, I might not understand. Sensory deprivation, so uh, people who may have autism, um, they can sometimes, or cerebral palsy or Down syndrome, they can sometimes have sensory deprivation where there's an overload of sound. So you don't want to go over the top. You don't want to, uh, you know, information overload, and you don't want it to be too much of a noisy environment. So how would you fix that? Disabilities. So are they able to understand you? Are they hearing impaired? Are they, um, you know, sight impaired? Cultural differences. Environmental problems. So you might be sitting in a room, it's too dark. Or you might be sitting in a place where there's too much noise, or maybe the light bulb keeps flickering. So that's an issue. Language differences, can you communicate with each other? Have you got the, um, are you able to understand each other? Health problems, so maybe someone's feeling really uncomfortable, maybe they're just not uh, happy being there. Dialect, so I know some people can uh, have a, an issue with certain dialects as well. So, you know, what sort of, uh, is it a Welsh dialect? Is it a British one? Is it a uh, um, Scottish one? What is a dialect? And then emotional distress. If somebody's really upset, they're not going to be in a situation where they can actually, uh, you know, really understand what's going on. Another thing I'd like to add to this is financial issues. There's a lot of uh, barriers can also be financial as well. What if there's some worries that are going on or you're not able to communicate with each other because you're, you know, if there's a particular person... You know, if, for example, if you're going in and you know that um, 
you know, one person, you think, oh my goodness, I can't speak today. So you're going in and there's two teams of people that should actually speak to one person. So you're doubling up on the, uh, um, you're wasting time, you're wasting money. So you're doubling up on the actual services that are done. So that's having a financial issue on that. On top of it, for yourself or staff, another barrier could be time. There might be a, um, a patient that really wants to speak to you, but you know that you've got another uh, six patients to go and see and you've only got half an hour to work. So are you going to have that 10, 20 minutes to speak to them? So time constraints can come into it as well. So foreign language and uh, cultural differences. So because we're in a multicultural country, I know that there can sometimes be uh, people with different uh, you know, languages. So different cultural groups will somebody with a particular cultural group will they want to be looked after by a male um clinician or do they just want female clinicians to help them what sort of care services should be done are you have you got the time to understand what this person is trying to tell you or to even get a, a translator or an interpreter to come in dialect again like we went through these are things that we've already uh, gone through And then we're going to go to 1M1. So has anybody got any questions before I uh, wait, make my way onto there? No. So for 1.4, we talked about barriers. Now, 1M1, you're just actually going to tell me how to fix those barriers. So on this section, it just really flows really easy. So 1.4, you're telling me exactly what my stop for communication. And then 1M1, you're telling me how communication will actually um, be overcome. So things that you can do for this is that you're uh, making changes to the environment. So maybe changing the way you approach the other person or maybe use an electronic aid like an iPad or hearing aids if the, the patient hasn't been fitted with them. So things that you can ease your difficulties. So you can do this by adapting your environment make changes to the physical environment and this can uh, improve um, the effectiveness of communication so replace any poor lighting or ask for it to be appraised uh, with a bright uh, light bulb maybe go into in a lot of the places that i've seen in a lot of hospitals that i've seen you actually have a sensory rooms there so um you can always go into a nice calm sensory room where it's full of nice soft padding on the floor it's got lights it's got nice little activities this is uh, so maybe you could move yourself into a different place soundproof the rooms just close the door this will help you to reduce background noise and it'll create an airy and noisy activity put up multilingual posters and displays so you're sorting out any sort of uh, language barriers and fix electronic devices like an induction loop to each of your areas so that you know that there won't be too much of an issue for hearing difficulties. So care workers can make the best of care within the environment that they are. So you need to be able to be seen clearly. So if you're, if it's poor lighting in the room, make sure that you face the light and the person at the same time so that they can see your mouth when you're speaking. Like I said, close the door if it's a lot of background, maybe move to another area or wait until the noise is finished and then communicate. Use your non-verbal communication, so your face expressions, gestures, thumbs up, little pat. And understand the language needs and what the person's preferences will be. So people who have sensory impairments, go to one of those sensory rooms. Maybe that will be easier. Get them comfortable. Make sure there's not too much noise or too many people around because it can uh, really uh, be distracting for somebody who might have sensory issues. Try and use the person's preferred language. So if you can speak the language, that's fantastic. If not, get an interpreter or a signer. And then just sort of adopt communication strategies that you've looked at. So you'll, you'll already, to be honest, within the environment that you're working, you already understand how to communicate quite well with a range of people. Pace, so slow down. If, for example, you're having to say something five, six times before somebody understands it, it's okay. Repeat it, rephrase it, 
change your wordings, try and make it simple for them. Don't be frustrated if you're trying to explain something and it's the third time you're explaining it and you're like, why can't you understand? So slow down. If for the second or third time you've said something and they've not understood, change what you're saying, make it simpler. Ask them what do they understand and then you'll be able to gain a little bit of knowledge about what have they gained from this conversation? Have they understood anything at all? How do you need to change it for them to be able to uh, get the concept of what you're saying? Use electronic devices if you need to. Use a text phone, use telephone amplifiers, use a hearing loops, use an iPad as a communication device. If they need something, a pen and paper, they're not able to communicate with you effectively, but they can write it down, maybe get them to do that. And then again, electronic uh, devices are fantastic. They help you to reduce outside noise. Speak clearly and slowly when you're speaking to um, others. Use interpreters. This is a synopsis of what you can do. Provide induction loops. Improve lighting. Adapt to your personal needs. Display clear signs. Listen carefully. So it's just really, to be honest, all of this is just the answers that you need to formulate. So this will answer your, uh, you could use these to um, answer your barriers. So change them and say that if there's a language issue, we need um, uh, an interpreter there. Speaking too fast can be a barrier. Having poor lighting can be a barrier. And then talk about how you're going to fix those. The last section is actually quite simple on here. So if you wanted to do the distinction question here, it is evaluate how different uses of technology can enhance or detract from good communication in health and social care settings. So all you've got to do is talk about different types of technology on here. You're going to talk about social media. You're going to tell me how it's um, enhanced uh, communication. Has it been easier for um, people to communicate because of social media? Are they more accessible? And then you can also talk about the bad points and say social media may sometimes makes people distracted. You're not having as much family time. You're always stuck on your phone. You can talk about emails. You can talk about uh, the internet, webinars, presentation, even like social media, um, sorry, technology that we're using now. We're physically all in different probably different cities, but in different areas. Some people might be at work, some of us at home or in offices. So it shows how we've been able to get together to do this, um, this session that we're doing today. So you can all include all of these types of things in and just show how technology is helpful and how it can also be a little bit bad as well sometimes. So the last one is quite simple. So I'm just going to turn the recording off.